Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to speak to you this afternoon about uh, a problem we had a couple of years ago on the Herschel Space Telescope. And uh, specifically, uh, we had a problem with the, with the focus of the telescope at cryogenic temperatures. This is a picture of the real, uh, the real telescope. It's three and a half meters in diameter. It's the largest uh, space telescope flying to date. Um, and the particular challenge for this telescope was that it had to, be, had, had to operate at 80 Kelvin. Uh, obviously built and tested at room temperature, but uh, qualified to operate at 80 Kelvin and to be at, at correct focus. So I will describe in brief the, the observatory. Uh, I'll describe the problem we found during the cryogenic optical testing of the telescope. Uh, in detail, I'll describe the, the optical model, the finite element model that was used in, in um, uh, modeling the performance and predicting the performance of the system. In particular, I'll focus on the stochastic analysis we did when we found the problem. I'll describe the, the, the solution we actually implemented based on the analysis we did. And then I'll say something about the, uh, uh, the lessons learned in, in conclusion. The mission. Um, the spacecraft currently is orbiting around a point in space called L2, which is uh, Lagrange point number two. This is a virtual point in space where there's an equi-gravitational potential field between the Earth's field and the Sun's <coughs> field. And you can actually orbit a spacecraft around this, around this point. It's particularly advantageous for uh, an infrared mission, cryogenic mission like Herschel, because it's a stable thermal environment. If we were orbiting the Earth, we would be going alternatively through day and night cycles, which would mean large thermal variations, large inputs to the system, which would disturb the thermal balance of the telescope. Um, this will also be the same place that the James Webb Space Telescope ultimately will be launched, uh, launched towards. So the, uh, the interesting point about this type of mission and this type of spacecraft is, of course, once we're out here, there is no way back and no way to repair. So we have to be absolutely sure we get it right before we launch. The spacecraft itself is about uh, seven meters tall. The, the major features are shown here. The, the, the telescope is what I'm going to discuss this afternoon in particular. Um, the telescope is the most important element of the spacecraft, obviously, because it receives the light from the sky, which the astronomers are interested in. Uh, it focuses it via primary mirror, secondary mirror, and through a hole in the primary mirror into uh, the instrument chamber here, which is an optical bench within what we call a cryostat. And this cryostat contains 2,300 litres of liquid helium at 1.65 Kelvin. That's used to actively cool the instruments on the optical bench. The telescope itself is not actively cooled, but is passively cooled by shielding from the sun shield and the solar array on the back side of the spacecraft. So the spacecraft always has the sun on this side, and this side of the spacecraft is always in the shadow. So that again ensures that we have a stable uh, thermal environment. The service module then is the last part here underneath, which contains all the control electronics, the radio frequency communications, the, uh, the propulsion system, and the guidance and control system, etc. The telescope uh, is unusual. It's the first uh, full ceramic telescope of its size ever put in space. Um, it's, the manufacturing process is shown here. It starts with a silicon carbide powder. Um, is pressed into segments of this shape. Th those segments are sintered or fired in an oven at 2,000 degrees Kelvin to give you a solid, a solid piece. The pieces are then assembled. It's a 12-segment mirror because it was impossible. We did not have industrial facilities large enough to make a single piece of silicon carbide of this size, so it we took a, um, a segment approach to, to building it. The segments after assembly in a, in a high, highly precision jig are then brazed together using a special joining process, which is like ceramic welding, it's called brazing, in an oven, uh, which was spe specially designed and built for this process. This is the result, the primary mirror, as it looked after brazing. What you see here on the front side are stiffening ribs to keep the structure stable and stiff during this entire process and for handling. The grinding then takes place, which brings the surface <coughs> to approximately, to exactly the right shape to enable the telescope to focus the light. And then following the grinding, which removes all these ribs on the front side, uh, we then have polishing and coating to give it the actual finished optical surface. 
and then the telescope is assembled. <coughs> the telescope is, is entirely made of silicon carbide except some critical parts which I will mention. Um, in order to validate and uh, qualify the telescope, its most important performance parameter, of course, was its optical performance. Um, in order to verify that it would work at 80 Kelvin and produce the right results, we had to test it in a representative environment. So we built a special tank, we put the entire telescope into this tank, and we had it enclosed in a thermal shroud, which was cooled by liquid helium to bring the telescope radiatively and conductively down to its operating temperature. We had a suite of optical instruments <coughs> outside the chamber looking through optical windows, looking through the telescope, and back again to measure the what we call the wavefront error of the telescope or the optical aberrations in the system. No optical system is perfect, so we knew in advance the type of aberrations we would expect and the type of distortions that would be induced into the system due to the cool down, because obviously going from ambient to 80 Kelvin, uh, you have shrinkage of the entire system and you have induced, uh, induced thermoelastic, <coughs> thermoelastic forces on the system. Um, the characterization of the telescope is done in this way. This is the type of image of what we call the wavefront error, which is essentially an optical way of saying the, the aberrations <coughs> inherent in the system. What we see is this effectively a picture looking through the telescope. What you see here is the shadow of the secondary mirror and its uh, supporting structure. It support, the secondary mirror is supported on three points in an isostatic way. Uh, this is a shadow of the, of the structure. But what is the, the, the dominant feature you hear, uh, here see is what we call trefoil, so three, three, uh, three axis symmetrical um, distortion of the telescope due to this three point mounting. Um, that's basically all I need to say there. And then, okay, the other thing which I'll mention also during the rest of the talk is that we use uh, a set of, uh, w we use a polynomial <laughs> system called Zernica to characterize the optical aberrations in the system. Uh, the Zernica polynomial is, is um, a, a polynomial system which has orthogonal uh, components and this proves to be, has proved to be very valuable in the optical field because each of the, each of the coefficients of the terms of the polynomial can be linked to optical aberrations which are classically used by optical engineers. And because they're orthogonal for a, a spherically symmetric system, this provides a very good way of, for an optical engineer to model the aberrations in the telescope. Okay, what did we have? We, this is a chart of the temperature of the telescope going from warm to cold versus the movement of the focus of the telescope uh, as we went down in temperature. The telescope was modelled using Nastran, uh, a Nastran model to build the, the telescope uh, system, and was linked then to an optical model which could be superimposed on the uh, surface of the structural model built in Nastran. The prediction made prior to the test was that we would have a shift of um, around 1.6, 1.7 millimeters going from room temperature to cold. Our goal uh, or our specification was that we should know the position of this focus point with an uncertainty of plus or minus five millimeters with a goal of trying to achieve uh, an uncertainty less than that, of plus or minus three millimeters. For me, when we started the test, I was concerned that we would not be able to see this in the noise if our, if our uncertainties were so large. However, I needn't have worried because when we actually measured, we had 11.6 shift. So this was significant and unexpected. But this is what the model said. Uh, this led, then led to uh, a very big question mark because we had to deliver a telescope for which we knew precisely where the focus was. Um, this order of magnitude was unexpected. Um, we did additional tests to verify that we could reproduce the result, so the, the result was reproducible. Uh, but we didn't understand it, so we then went into a root cause investigation using a, using a dedicated uh, Tiger team. So, the Tiger team was mandated uh, to examine the problem 
and to determine the root cause and to propose a solution. Because, of course, we had to... The, the, the other feature of this telescope I should mention is that it is a fixed focus telescope, meaning that there is no adjustment of focus possible. This was a deliberate uh, design feature from the beginning of the program because of the risk and complexity of building a focusing mechanism to work at 70 Kelvin was at that point when the design was done in the early 90s or mid 90s, it was considered too risky. <coughs> uh, and secondly, the focus depth of the telescope, which I'll mention later again, was sufficiently large that we felt we could uh, be well within that uncertainty limit without risking um, underperformance of the instruments which, which sit in the focal plane of the telescope. But we were then confronted with this problem and the scientists uh, immediately were screaming at us, uh, we told you so, you should have had a focusing mechanism, but okay. Um, so what we needed to look at was the metrology, how we did the measurements, was the measurement technique correct? Uh, could it be independently verified? Was it traceable? Uh, and were there, were there uncertainties we had missed in there? Um, the models, of course, this, this became a really hot topic. Uh, how, how we modeled the system, was that done sufficiently accurately? Both the, the mechanical structural modeling, the thermal modeling, and the optical modeling. Um, the data analysis and knowledge accurate, uh, uh, the data analysis, had we had we done the analysis of the test data correctly? Was there anything we, we had missed in there which could have also given reason to this uh, result? And then finally, uh, material coefficients became also uh, in, in, our, in our sites once we started to examine the problem. Because, of course, the output of FM is dependent on the assumptions you make and the knowledge you have of the material build that you put into the system. So the conclusion was the metrology was okay, the models were generally okay in terms of how they were built uh, and constructed and the, the meshing, etc. Uh, construction was okay. But we firmly concluded that the, the material coefficients of the system were not sufficiently accurately measured. Of course, this led to uncertainty and variability and the whole approach then of using a stochastic method to analyze, uh, analyze the problem. The flight solution we actually implemented was to shim the telescope or move it slightly with respect to its original uh, position on the spacecraft uh, in order to ensure that uh, in flight the focus would be at the correct position within the uncertainty margins of the focal depths of the three instruments in the focal plane. Okay, a little bit of optical modeling. Um, the telescope is basically it's a very simple system in principle. It's only two mirrors, a primary and a secondary, with a, an, a, a precise distance between the two and precise radii of curvature of the two mirrors. So this is, the primary is concave, the, the secondary is convex. And the, as you see, the right, light rays here come from the sky, which is effectively, you're looking at sources at an infinite distance, which is why the, the, the rays are parallel. And then you come to a focus in the focal surface. Note that the focal surface in this case is not a plane, it's not a focal plane, but a, a, a curved surface, which is a parabola in this case. So the, the critical parameters here are the inter-separation distance of the two mirrors, the radii of curvature of the two mirrors, and what we call the BFL, or the back focal length. So the distance between the vertex of the primary and the vertex of the, of the focal surface. Uh, this telescope can be fully optically, analytically characterized by this relatively straightforward formula here in terms of the back focal length, where it is from these, from these parameters. Um, but small changes, obviously, in R1, R2, and D will impact the back focal length. And this is precisely what we were dealing with. Um, the back focal length had moved in a way which we didn't understand. So we initially focused on, on these parameters. Um, and then the, the other point which I'll now discuss is the material system, the material build of the telescope. Here we have a schematic showing you how the telescope is made up uh, of its component parts. So again, the primary mirror, the secondary mirror, the secondary mirror support itself and the support structure, and then interface pieces between the support structure 
and the load bearing structure of which are a set of three bipods interfacing to the three isostatic mounting points on the, on the primary. Here you see the material system. So you can see it's predominantly silicon carbide. Uh, this, is a, this is a well chosen material for uh, use in cryogenic temperatures. Uh, because it's, it, it had been reasonably well, it had been well developed and well characterized prior to, prior to its use in this. But we couldn't get away from having metal structures in here to uh, accommodate the load, load bearing structure here, which is critical obviously for the launch phase. So we have these pieces here are made from cryogenic invar, which is a special um, stainless steel alloy uh, designed for use in cryogenic, uh, under cryogenic conditions. And then the bipods themselves are made of, of titanium. And then the final element in the, in the structure is a series of uh, thermal isolation blankets um, <clears throat> made, from, made from Kapton, which is, uh, which is a polymeric material in, in three, three layers to isolate radiative thermal exchange from the relatively warm spacecraft underneath to the, the cold uh, surface of the primary mirror. Just to show you exactly what it actually looks like, here's a photograph of one of the bipods with its interface to the uh, isostatic mounting structure on the back side of the primary. You see the characteristic uh, blue-gray color of the silicon carbide. You see the lightweighting ribs of the underlying structure of the rear of the primary mirror. And you see the, the precision of the the interface here. We have also strain gauges on these load-bearing structures to monitor the strains being introduced at all stages of the assembly integration and test of the, of the system to ensure that we were never overloading this or introducing forces which could distort the primary mirror. On the, on the top side of what I just showed you here then we have the load-carrying structure in cryogenic invar of the, the hexapod. So the hexapod is, um, as I showed you before, let's go back to the first figure, is this, is this structure here. It's actually a tripod, but it has, in fact, two legs per, per structure, so it's therefore called a hexapod. But uh, it obviously has to carry the load uh, of the secondary mirror, but in addition, not only carry the load, but also ensure that the stability of the secondary mirror versus the primary mirror is maintained during all phases of the construction, the test, the build, launch, and operation in space. So this is a very critical, critical structure. And of course, it had to hold the distance between these two to a precision necessary to ensure we, we knew where the focus was. <laughs> So, using our um, parametric analytical model of the telescope, uh, the first look was to look at it in a, in a purely parametric way, um, simulate the inter, intermirror distance by a simple mathematical f physical model of the materials within the system, so the silicon carbide, the cryogenic invar, uh, with the relevant CTEs for the two types of material, to uh, simulate the cool down straightforwardly and then to calculate what the change in this distance was versus what we expected. Um, this is the, the room temperature. The, the change in those, uh, the, the strain induced by going down to 70 Kelvin from, from the room temperature value, the, the actual changes and then the sensitivities and the contribution to the, the overall change in back focal length. <coughs> What I've highlighted here is the extreme sensitivity of the D value, or the inter-separation distance between the primary and the secondary. The reason why this is so large is because this is not just a mechanical system, it's an optomechanical system. And what we're concerned about is, is the relative movement of the focal surface for any changes in this distance. And that has an amplification of 266, which means that if we move the uh, secondary mirror by one micron, we get 266 micron movement of the, of the focus. So that meant the system, as designed and built, was extremely 
sensitive to these uh, uh, separation changes and obviously as a result to the, the CTEs of the two principal components in this chain, INVAR and, and silicon carbide. Okay, uh, the calculation we did in three different ways. Um, <coughs> each, each is slightly more complex and, and higher order way of doing it. As I described earlier, we just used it using the paraxial formula where we calculated the deltas in change of the radii of curvature because as you cool down, of course, the, the, the radius will change. And the, and the uh, physical change of the separation between the two we calculated from the finite element model used that in the, in, the, in the paraxial formula and then calculated the change in back focal length as this went from uh, ambient to cold. The next level up was to, um, I mentioned the Zernica coefficients are the way that the optical engineers have of characterizing the aberrations within the system. No optical system is perfect. We knew what the aberrations inherent in the design of this system were. We had a first order knowledge of what the um, contributions were from the structure and the build of the system because we had measured it at ambient temperature. So we combined the two here. Um, we scaled the, the optical model to fit with the, with the FEM model and to scale with the, the paraxial model and then perform a ray tracing, so an optical analysis of the system using optical techniques to, to uh, find where the focus position is. And then the third was to incorporate the next level of complexity which is using the, um, the Zernica coefficients fitted to the knowledge of the optical surfaces, the primary and the secondary, and the induced changes from the thermo, thermoelastic FEM analysis. We combined that with the, with the Zernicas, we essentially did a fit, and then reran the optical model again to verify that all of these, all of these three different approaches uh, produce the same uh, uh, result. Just briefly on the structural model, so uh, as part of the investigation when we were faced with this problem, we of course, as part of the uh, procurement of the telescope, and the telescope was procured by the European Space Agency from our, our uh, industrial partners, EADS Astrium in, in Toulouse, as part of their delivery to us, they delivered an Astron model. Um, we had five to six weeks of this Tiger team working intensively to solve the issue. Within the first week we came to the conclusion there was no point in us rebuilding the Nastron model from scratch because it's too complex, would take too long, and it didn't add any value. So we made, we made the assumption that we could use the baseline model as delivered to us as uh, verify, verified and, and usable but we reran it ourselves with, with our own control and with our own, uh, with our own inputs. It's, a, it's a basically a model based on a, a plate, bar and beam elements which is shown schematically here. You can see the, uh, the, the different elements. You see also on the back side which is important is that the uh, light weighting structure is also uh, represented uh, quite accurately. Um, <coughs> We did make some modifications. We upgraded the, uh, the surface modeling of the secondary was not captured in sufficient accuracy to be able for us to optically match the, the FEM grid structure with the uh, optical model with sufficient uh, precision to be able to use the output of the combined surface in, in our optical ray tracing. So we had, to, we had to go to double precision on that. Um, and then the, the next important point which I'll go on to now is the material properties. Uh, we started with the material CTE properties, these two values, 1.21 for silicon carbide and 1.36 for INVAR. We eventually ended up with new values based on our analysis of the input data. And here I come to the issue of variability and uh, the, the need for the stochastic analysis. Uh, as part of the build of the telescope by uh, Astrium, they did substantial numbers of laboratory tests on the materials uh, used in the system. <coughs> and they used a number of different laboratories in order to uh, ensure themselves and validate to us that they were covering 
um, that they were um, capturing well the, the uncertainty in the material properties. However, what we ended up with was a very large spread of both CTEs at the cryogenic temperature where we wanted to operate, both for uh, silicon carbide and, and INVAR. And this is why I asked the question to Louise this morning. Okay, how do you choose from this population? Um, there was no easy solution when we started discussing this problem because we discovered then in discussing in detail with the industry who requested all these measurements that they had done their own internal weighting measurement by measurement and decided that they would cho choose this value and this value with their own ad hoc uh, hand-waving qualitative assessment based on the knowledge they had from the individuals in the different labs and from the knowledge they had of experience working with these labs before. But this, this gave us the clue that there, there was something going on here which we needed to understand. So what we did in the TIGER team then, we said, okay, let's look at this as an upper and lower bound. Let's choose a value in between there because we had no better way of weighting the data. Uh, without independently going back to all the labs and going through all their data, but we didn't have time to do that. So we, we said, okay, let's choose a value in the middle with a plus or minus 20% uh, variability on that. This just shows in more detail the, the type of problem we were facing. So that's the INVAR and that's the, that's the silicon carbide. What I show here are some of the qualitative statements made about the different curves. So you can see there's quite a quite a variability in these outputs and and when you're faced with this you you have to say okay how do i uh, how do i judge which is the best number to choose for my finite element analysis so this was before we applied the stochastic or the variability analysis to the problem because our our contractors astrium they decided uh, when they were building the system okay we need to choose one number with some uncertainty but they didn't they didn't go to the next step because, of course, they were under pressure to deliver to us and, uh, and, and get paid. However, uh, th this is significant. This curve is significant here. And you see it's at, an, at, it's at one upper bound of the, of the spread of the data. But it would not be obvious unless you had uh, detailed knowledge of what was, what was behind. So um, in order to, for us to validate the measurements that we made, we try to represent as accurately as possible the thermal conditions during the, uh, the cryogenic optical test. And this is a representative of the thermal mapping of the system uh, during one of the cycles, which we call cryo-2, which was uh, representative of uh, the stable conditions during the test, where we measured the, the, the defocus. Uh, you can see we have a gradient from top to bottom, and we have a gradient from the f optical surface at the front to the, 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 uh, the surface behind. So we used all these numbers, mapped them again to the, the finite element model um, uh, in order to do the, in order to, in order to verify the, uh, the focus shift we were seeing. And then we went into uh, the first stage of the analysis, and we, we said, okay, let's, let's just focus on two properties, which is the CTEs of the, the SIC and the INVAR. This came out of the, of the analysis we were doing as we went along, that the, the Poisson's ratio um, and, the, and the Young's modulus were not drivers in terms of the performance of the system, but that this D space error was driven primarily by the CTEs. So we decided to focus on those two parameters as being the most important. So we did an initial parametric analysis just by doing a three by three matrix, looking at the computed change in back focal length going from ambient to cold conditions for three different uh, values of the CTE. So if I go back to here, so we said, okay, let's take an upper and lower bound. Uh, let's take a mid value, an upper value and a lower value and see what the spread is for cross-checking all those parameters against each other in a simplistic matrix. And this is what's illustrated here. This is the change in length of this uh, intermirror distance uh, versus temperature. OK, 
how was this done? This was then done using a combination of tools. Uh, as I said, our, our FEM was basically constructed in Nastron, which is, which is the tool we use also in, in ESA and was also used by our contractors. Um, the uh, initial computations were done uh, parametrically uh, to find these fit curves which I showed you in the previous slide. The CTEs uh, were computed out of that. Then they were mapped using the uh, thermal mapping, was, uh, I should say, was imposed on the, on the finite element model analysis. The material uh, group values were put in. Using Python, then we generated the CTE variance for the, the material groups uh, using the TMAP. Uh, then into Nastron, compute the distortion for each of the nine cases, um, and then compute the deltas and the, cha the change in radius of, uh, radi radii of curvature. Um, yeah, so the, the ultimately we just used the paraxial formula to do this in an, in an efficient way, because we were doing all this computation in real time in a, in a team effort, as I said, over five, uh, five six weeks in order to come out with the results. So this was the easiest way of doing it in a, in a, in a first order approach to ensure that we were covering the right parameter space to be able to quantify the problem and to address the solution. So here, here is the outcome. Um, what you see here is the, the CTE space uh, for silicon carbide uh, for INVAR versus the change in, in, in back focal length. And what we see here are the actual values coming out now, there are two, two sets of numbers here. One is for a uniform temperature distribution on the telescope. So we said, okay, let's take a simple case where we know where we, uh, um, which should be representative of, uh, of uh, a purely analytical approach. We have a, a single temperature for all elements. And then we compare it with an with a actual gradient which the telescope experienced during, during the test and see what the delta is there. What you can see here is in that the, the um, the distribution where the indicated values of the CTE were preferred in order to give us the uh, change in back focal length that we actually measured. So we're working backwards, we're saying, what do we need to input to the model to see what we're seeing from the metrology? Okay, and it indicates that we were looking at a, um, a higher uh, value of CTE for INVAR and a lower value of CTE for, for um, silicon carbide in order to uh, be in the right region of the parameter space to see the outcome that we saw from the test. Then we decided, okay, that gave us a good feeling that we were going in the right direction. Okay, let's go the next step. Let's, let's introduce real variability. Let's take a stochastic <laughs> approach. Um, and then this was done again using this, uh, this com combined solver uh, method and using um, a software system called STORM. Uh, I'm not sure I know what that stands for anymore, but uh, it's, it's a tool which uh, one, of our, um, one of our mechanical engineers was using at the time and said, oh, I think this can be useful here. Uh, so it's a, it's a meta, meta tool or something. Anyhow. Uh, so we went through this loop then um, statistically using Monte Carlo uh, a statistical approach to generate random telescopes basically within this parameter space. So we said, okay, we constrain the parameter space to where we think it should be and then we, we do the random approach and we generate multiple telescopes and let's look at the distribution and see what comes out of there and see can we correlate. Uh, with the result, with the actual results we see. So this was to try and understand the behavior of the telescope in a more realistic way, given that we, th all the parameters were not uh, under our control. Um, the second, oh yeah, the, the effects taken into account, as I mentioned, were driven mostly by the CTE, but we did in the stochastic uh, parameter space also then include the Young's modulus, the shear modulus, the Poisson's ratio and the CTEs of other elements within the telescope. We again looked at the input loads, which is met basically in our case driven by the temperature variation going from ambient to cold. Uh, and then we looked at the geometry <coughs> of some of the uh, f uh, 
finer elements within the system, like there's a, an aluminium coating on the front surface of the primary mirror and on the secondary mirror, which also induce effectively a, um, a bimetallic effect when you cool down because of the differential CTEs there. That also has a, a quantifiable effect. And the brazing joints, we have these joints of brazing between the 12 petals, and that braze joint, while it's matched almost exactly to the CT of silicon carbide. It's still slightly different in its, in, its, in its constitution and its CT and its behavior. And we wanted to be able to qual quantify that also. So all of those went into the uh, stochastic simulation mix. Uh, what we saw then, when you look at the, the output in terms of the change in this back focal length parameter that I've been mentioning now consistently, we looked at what was the distribution and contribution of the different elements, and we can see we're, we are completely dominated by uh, INVAR and SICK, um, with smaller contributions from the others. So this led us once again back to the materials problem. Here I show uh, two examples of the stochastic analysis where you see the point cloud which came out, you see we have a linear variation. This is uh, back focal length change versus delta CTE between INVAR and SICK. So the difference between the INVAR and SICK because of this, this became also critical to understand very well because of the join between the silicon carbide and the INVAR at this interface point of the tripod holding the secondary mirror, which effectively controls the intermirror separation. This, this was the critical parameter to look at. We could see that for... Um, for the back focal length that we actually measured, we could see we're, we're at the edge of the distribution, but it's still a valid, still a valid outcome. And if we look at the trefoil, which I mentioned earlier, this is this tri tri uh, three, three, th three axis symmetric optical aberration due to the isostatic mounting of the telescope. If we quantify <laughs> that and look at that also, we saw we're also still within the parameter space, but at the edge. Uh, in order to get the the at uh, the right value, um, so this gave us the region of space we wanted to uh, uh, get at in order to understand um, where where exactly were these CTE values of the materials in the as-built telescope as opposed to the uh, theoretically modelled telescope. So in a sense, the telescope itself ended up being a much more sensitive measurement tool for measuring CTE than the independent test labs because of this uh, 266 amplification factor became extremely sensitive as a, as a metrology tool, but that's not really what we designed it for. Uh, schematically then, what was the outcome? The outcome was, this is, this is the telescope, the primary mirror, the secondary mirror, the, the light coming in from the sky and the focal, focal point here. This is obviously, obviously not to scale, but it's, it's done just purely schematically to show <coughs> what we were dealing with. So the, the nominal interface of the telescope of the two bipods is here. We plan to have a, a metallic shim in between the feet of the bipods and the interface on the spacecraft, which was our required interface where we had to be to position the distance of the telescope uh, vertex from here to here was a, was a, uh, a design number. Uh, with an uncertainty. So this shimming here was designed to be uh, adaptable so that if we had um, seven plus or minus five available. Here you see the plus or minus five coming back again because originally the design of the telescope was that the focus should be here within our uncertainty requirement, knowledge requirement of plus or minus five to ensure that the, the instruments would be close enough to the focus point to be uh, performing well. We were outside that range, obviously. That's where we were when we did after metrology. So we had to shim to bring, a, to bring this back to here, and this is what we did. Now, I mentioned already earlier that this 11.7 is what we, what we got out of the metrology, but there were some effects which uh, were not actually taken into account. Uh, one of the critical tests we have to do on launching anything into space is to actually shake it to uh, make sure that it will survive the launch environment. And you always have some mechanical settling of interfaces. 
th this was a contribution not taken into account. When we go into space, we also have no gravitational vector acting on the system. So on the ground, the gravitational vector is acting this way, so it acts to compress this distance slightly. This was not fully taken into account in the test uh, because we had actually, what we did on the test actually, we actually offloaded the primary mirror from the backside with a special um, mechanism to compensate for the gravitational pull which would make the radius of curvature artificially smaller. So we actually compensated for that, but what we could not compensate for was the, was the secondary. Um, and then the other final point, which is what came out of the investigation, is that we uh, had higher precision. We, we determined that the system itself was telling us that the CTUs were different than what was used in the model uh, for the prediction of the success of the test or not. So taking these additional elements into account, uh, we finally came up with a, 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 a correction distance of 8.6 to bring this focus position back to where it should be. So we added another shim here uh, prior, to, prior to flight. Um, the Tiger team, as I said, w w had a very short period of, to operate, five, six weeks. Uh, we couldn't do any uh, further investigation either on the telescope or the materials during that time. There wasn't enough resources available or time available to do that. But in parallel, one of the outcomes of the Tiger team was to mandate the project to make additional measurements on uh, materials from the build, uh, elements that were used in the system, and to re-measure them in other labs which had higher precision uh, and better traceability than the ones that were used by our industry. So we went to two labs. We had a collaboration with NASA JPL in California who had built a, a metrology system based on um, an, an optical uh, tool called a Michelson interferometer and a highly stabilized laser source. So this was linked inherently to the primary standard. And we went to a, a commercial company called PMIC in Oregon who also do cryogenic testing of large structures. So those provided new data, uh, which, is, which, are, which I quote here. And what we can see is that um, we have quite a significant change uh, in the material properties compared with what, uh, what we had originally from, from our industrial suppliers. Um, we needed this much change, 0 0.9 ppm per Kelvin would be needed to fully explain the, the discrepancy that we saw, but we don't, we don't get that and it doesn't fully explain it. Um, but if we, take that, if we take that into account, we get closer to what we, um, what we expected than, than what came out originally. Uh, and it comes closer to what we actually implemented in the, in the final shimming. Uh, finally, just to show you what the effect is and why, this, why depth of focus is of interest to uh, optical systems like this, if you, if you look at the size of a spot or a star image as you move through the focus of a telescope or an optical instrument, you will get essentially a spot which changes in shape as you go from inside focus to outside focus. The best focus is around here where you have the minimal spot with the best uh, symmetrical shape. Within a, range <coughs> around the, within a range around the best focus, depending on how the instruments that use this that use these spots, that you use this light, um, depending on how they are designed and the wavelength at which they operate, um, they will have a range of tolerance of focus, i.e. within this range they will not be able to distinguish any change in the shape of the spot. So this is a theoretical model from an electromagnetic code used to model the telescope. And we know that within this depth of focus, the most accurate uh, instrument on the system which was operating down to a wavelength of 60 microns could not determine any change in here. So we knew that if we're anywhere within this range of getting the focus position correct, then that we, w we would have a success for the, the, the most critical instrument. Um, So I just summarize here what the results were finally using the, the updated values of the CTE. So we still had a, um, 
a difference with the test result when we take this new value into account. We still had a 3.9 3 millimeter. Um, but if we look at the range of uncertainty for the uh, metrology uh, as done on the telescope, we had a plus minus 3 um, uncertainty on the final knowledge accuracy of where the focus was. So we see within that error bound we can have a low as low as 0 0.9. So we're, we, we satisfied ourselves that we had reasonably well captured the problem and we were close enough to matching the uncertainties between the different uh, elements, metrology and modeling, that we could say with confidence that uh, the approach taken and the result um, the, 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 the result given and the, um, uh, the proposal made to do the shimming at the level we did was consistent with everything we studied and would be sufficient for flight. Now the final problem we had with this um, was that we had to implement the shimming blind because once we tested the telescope on its own end to end there was no further possibility to test optically on the ground because the instruments were enclosed within their cryostat. The cryostat was cooled down, was full of liquid helium and we could not open it before launch because it would take too long to cool down and you had risk of contamination. So the cryostat had a, actually a physical lid which was only openable on orbit. So we had to rely on all the analysis we did, all the subsequent, subsequent materials testing, all the cross-checking etc. to be able to say with confidence that yes we think it will be focused in flight but we would not know until we flew and opened the cryostat and made the first first measurements. So this just summarizes what I've uh, what I've said. This is the important point for us was the telescope was shimmed based on the metrology data not the model. So while we did extensive additional work on the modelization and we convinced ourselves that variability was a very important parameter to take into account it did not convince us that the original model as used to make the prediction was sufficiently uh, robust uh, to use and therefore we convinced ourselves that the metrology data in that case was the more reliable data set to use for the engineering solution. I'll show you an image in a moment that uh, it provided big relief. A month after we launched we opened the cryostat and we saw a very nice image which was I must say a big uh, aha moment and a huge relief uh, for me and the team. Um, we learned the lessons learned, stochastic analysis proved to be an extremely powerful and useful tool to constrain the behavior and to check the model against the as-built behavior. So validation for us is always critical because we only build one of every spacecraft uh, so we have to be absolutely sure. Um, one of the big lessons for me was that the variability in the modeling process was not adequately used from the start and this is this is something we will we are now taking into account um, an initial cryogenic check test to see okay where are we rather than relying 100 percent on the model and saying this is what the model predicts therefore this is our test success criteria off we go it would have been better in my view uh, a little bit more costly but maybe more cost effective in the end to do an initial check say we think we're going to be around this region but we're not going to say what we what we predict the test to do until we do a check test so cool the system down quickly see where you are validate that correlate your model and then go into the real test it would have been more cost effective and that would have would have saved a lot of uh, grief and effort but okay at a certain point uh, the cost risk balance, balance analysis is done and the costing people say no we can't afford the extra month to do that test. Hubble made the same uh, judgment call. They said we are not going to test an end-to-end -end telescope. They tested the secondary thoroughly. They tested the primary thoroughly and they even tested the primary in two different methods, completely independent methods, which yielded contradictory results and they, to their uh, ultimate regret, threw away the right result and took the, correct, took the incorrect one and the rest is history. So we, at least we learned from that. 
Uh, and then the final lesson, which we're already implementing also, we have an R&D program ongoing on this at the moment, is that uh, material CTEs at cryo, under cryogenic conditions, is absolutely critical for building such um, challenging telescopes. Uh, I leave you with more information there and the acknowledgements. It's obviously, I'm only the messenger for a, a huge team of, of people who have been working over many, many years to build this system. It's a great credit to them. Uh, I'm just presenting a small part of the output. This was a successful launch. Um, that's what the actual spacecraft looks like. So you can see again how big it is. And this is the cryostat behind here full of the, full of the liquid helium. Um, <coughs> This one, I, th th this is the result from space. So, on the ground, we made this prediction based on the the best knowledge we had of the wave front error and the aberration of the telescope at cold. <coughs> we made a prediction of the essentially the spot, the, what we call the point spread function, and this is what we saw actually in space. So, this was the aha moment. We got it right. So, thank you very much for your attention.